Hello and welcome. My name is Caitlin Stewart, and today we will be considering the differences between primary and secondary sources. Oftentimes, students are asked to use a certain number of primary and secondary sources for a project or paper. But what does this mean? How do you know? Are primary sources only historical? Right off the bat, it's important to know that primary and secondary sources work together. Most good projects or papers will have both because they contain different types of information and provide different perspectives. Before we get started, there will be some activities in this module, so make sure that you have either a writing utensil and a paper or a document to type in before you proceed. Primary sources provide first-hand accounts of a given event, experience, or practice. These accounts are often made by witnesses or first recorders of events at about the time they occurred, but this is not always the case. For example, oral histories can occur far after an event. What is distinctive about primary sources is that they do not rely on other sources for their information. Sometimes they may reference other sources, such as a writer in a Civil War era diary discuss discussing a pamphlet they saw, but part of the information the primary source provides is grounded in their own experience. Primary sources tend to be more humanized and personal, but they may be representative of only one person's perspective. Primary sources can include diaries, letters, reports, photographs, creative works, financial records, memos, newspaper articles, minutes, oral histories, and more. All of these show a sliver of life in a moment. Primary sources do not have to be historical, although this is a common misperception. Any text that you send today could be considered a primary source for your experience. Many people use more primary sources unknowingly without strictly classifying them as primary sources. Secondary sources are created later by someone who did not experience an event firsthand. A good way to remember this is that primary sources come first and secondary sources come second. Secondary sources are often made by scholars, reporters, or professionals who analyze and interpret primary sources. It is important to be aware that secondary sources can contain information that is a primary source. For example, a biography, which is a secondary source, could have excerpts from historical letters, which are primary sources. Likewise, a newspaper article could have quotes from an eyewitness. The newspaper article might not be a primary source, but the quotes from the eyewitness would be. These secondary sources can be books, articles, newspapers, textbooks, biographies, encyclopedias, dictionaries, literature reviews, and more. Because these sources come later than primary sources, there is more of a delay in their publication. Additionally, they tend to synthesize information from both primary sources and often other secondary sources. This often means that they are longer. We will now move into looking at what these differences mean using an example. Let's pretend that you know your research question is, how have various stakeholders responded to Seattle's initiatives and approaches to creating and preserving green spaces as the city has grown in population? To write this paper, you would need to consider how to fully answer the question. Who are the various stakeholders? What have been Seattle's initiatives and approaches to creating and preserving green spaces? How much has the city's population changed? How has this impacted urban planning in Seattle? There are many sub-questions that exist within your bigger research question. To answer the bigger question, you have to keep the smaller ones in mind. Using the research question just introduced and displayed on the right-hand side of the slide here, take a minute and list primary and secondary sources you might use to research this question. Be specific, especially more specific than book and magazine. I have provided a start to this. Primary sources might be resident interviews, statistics of green space coverage, urban planning sketches, or government plans. Secondary sources might include newspaper articles on Seattle's population growth, books on historic Seattle parks, and an environmental city comparison between Seattle and Portland. Pause the slide now and try to add at least four more sources to both the list of possible primary sources and secondary sources. Continue on to the next slide when you are ready.
You might have noticed that interwoven with the research necessary for this question are many different perspectives. I've included six on this slide, but there are many more. How developers, ecologists, reporters, residents, city planners, and parks and recreation government employees respond to Seattle's initiatives and approaches to creating and preserving green spaces as the city has grown in population is likely very different because they each have different priorities and experiences. By leaving out a certain perspective in this paper, you are sharing the narrative that is presented. A resident of the city might talk about their personal experience. They might share that in their neighborhood, there are no parks within walking distance because condos were built where the park used to be. They might share how this makes taking their children out to play harder and less safe. A city planner who maybe doesn't live in Seattle might not be able to provide that perspective. Instead, they might talk about choices in design, considering the maximum good for the maximum number of people when there is high demand to live in the city and limited space. An ecologist might provide research data on the air pollution in Seattle as green spaces disappear. Notice how these sources all provide different types of information that paint a larger, more cohesive picture together that should work to answer our research question. Consider how you might not trust the city planner to do a scientific analysis of the ecology of Seattle. They are all experts in the certain types of information that they provide. Each has different pieces of information to offer, and some are more likely than others to create primary or secondary sources. This is part of why it is often crucial to use both kinds of sources. We will now look into what types of sources the resident, parks and recreation, and reporter might provide. One source might be the petition by Seattle residents to try to prevent the loss of trees in the city. This petition urges the local government to update Seattle's tree protection ordinance. You might use this source as one example of how residents feel about the preservation of green space. A second source might be the City of Seattle's Parks and Recreation Department's 2017 Parks and Open Space Plan. This might show you current initiatives or approaches towards green spaces. A third source might be Seattle Weekly's article, As Development Booms, Seattle Gives Up on Green Space which is written by a local uh, reporter. This source aggregates statements and opinions from other sources. Take a minute and decide whether or not each of these sources is a primary or secondary source. See if you can explain to yourself why you think the way you do. Remember that this line is not always clear and there might not always be one right answer. Okay, well, here I'm showing you my right answer, but I can guarantee some people would disagree with this. The petition I consider a primary source because it is a first-hand account. A number of people that signed the petition are saying that in their experience, there are not enough trees in Seattle. The open space plan is a more traditional primary source because it is a government document that explicitly lays out a first-hand account of what the Seattle Parks and Recreation Department is intending to do. I marked the newspaper as a secondary source because it was relying so heavily on other sources and analyzing them. Don't be disheartened if any of yours are different than mine. Just make sure you can justify your answer to yourself. What it comes down to is that sometimes the distinction between a primary and secondary source is not always clear. You may have noticed that earlier on in this presentation, newspaper articles were listed as both a primary and secondary source of information. Look at this example from Seattle Weekly. The newspaper article is providing quotes directly from a Seattle resident on their experience with green spaces in Seattle. These quotes would indisputably be a primary source, but would the whole newspaper article? The line between whether or not a newspaper article is primary or secondary has to do with the level of analysis. An article that took quotes from Rubin and then used them to make a larger comment on Seattle's loss of open space or compared them to other accounts would be a secondary one. However, if a newspaper article strictly interviewed Rubin, if they reported his story directly from him without this additional layer of analysis or interpretation, that may be a primary source. There is not always a clear answer on where this line exists, but having a rough sense can help you know how to approach the source and how to use it best to support your purposes. The distinction between primary and secondary sources essentially comes down to one main idea. What is the level of analysis or interpretation done using sources beyond one's own experience? A good way to check this is using a thought experiment. 
If you removed all outside sources of information, what would be left in your source? The more that is left, the more confident you can be that your source is primary. Leaving with that, thank you so much for your time, and I hope the distinction between primary and secondary sources and how they fit together to make research more complete is now more clear to you.